Cool. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to be speaking basically about, it should really be building scalable mobile applications. But before I go ahead, let me just introduce myself. Um, my name is Luigi Mario Zuccarelli, and I was actually named before the Mario, Luigi Mario brother thing came out, so <laughs> just in case you get the jokes. Um, I, um, I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat mobile application platform, and um, uh, I moved from Italy, from Milan, Italy, about two years ago, and um, I always get asked, why did you move from Milan to Waterford Island? And um, you know, I always have to explain to people, so I said, just basically, it's all about Red Hat, really. Um, in 19, oh, going back now, 1996, 97, I was working for a bank doing some Java application. Java was still new, uh, still on, we are sort of moving from Microsoft to running from C, C++ to Visual C in those days, um, to Java for our applications. And, and so because of the whole open source thing, I thought, let me, let me get into... I had a CD of, of, of Linux, I think it was 3.6 of, of uh, Red Hat Linux. I had a, a, a laptop at the time, so I thought, let me try. Put it on, try and get the thing to work. And seriously, after three months, I gave up. I took the, I took the CD and threw it in the dustbin and said, well, that's the end for, for me and, and Linux. And being, being someone that just, I just, you know, was just bugging me, I had to try and get it to work. Anyway, eventually, after some, some, some attempts, I got a new version of Linux, put it on my laptop, and it worked well, and that was me, sold completely with Java, with Linux, the whole open source thing. And I said to my wife at the time, um, you know what, one day I'm going to be working for this company. And she said, what's the company? I said, Red Hat. And anyway, two years, uh, two years ago, the offer came up um, to move to Waterford. I had to look on a map. I really don't know where Waterford was in Ireland. Um, and the guy said, look, th this is part of the offer. You have to move. And I said, well, being Red Hat, I'm going to move. And... Um, the rest is all history. So I'm really happy to, to be using the technologies we're using and happy to be here tonight. So basically, um, what I want to do is just sort of give you some, and I hate the word handles, but actually that's what it is at the end of the day. We have 30 minutes to talk. Um, I had some code snippets and a demo to show you guys, but we all know that same, like demos just go wrong. Snippets are boring and... You know, so the thing is, I'm going to talk about scaling mobile applications. And um, as an introduction, just give you sort of the feedback of the Red Hat mobile application platform. Um, the bulk of my talk would be um, about this sort of design aspects of scaling applications, mobile applications particularly, and you could actually even extend it to web applications. And then just give you the handles, links, and information about how to do it. So, the first thing, we are JavaScript fundies. Um, so basically, why did we choose to use Node.js and Cordova to build our Red Hat mobile application? And um, the, there's... I mean, I'm, I know I'm speaking to the converter, but there's lots of as, sort of aspects to that. So, why no JS? Um, I don't want to go through the whole list, but I think the biggest one for us was footprint. Um, you're building an application for the cloud, for mobile applications, and we've come from a world of, of Java. Um, the, the actual start of our Red Hat mobile application was with a company from, that started off from the University of, of, of Wit, um, uh, Waterford, and it was then, um, as a, started off as a basic, uh, it was called Feed Henry at the time, and it started off as an XML feed, an RSS feed onto a mobile application, and as you know, lots of requirements and updates and changes, and we needed to put it on iOS and on a tablet and so on. And so your application's changing and morphing all the time. 
And they decided, look, being a Java, it was based on Java. Being a Java application, footprint was heavy. Um, looked at Node at the time, this was about eight years ago, and it, it just made sense. It scaled well, it was easy to use. The rest, uh, um, I suppose you all know about and you, you're sort of familiar with. And then why Cordova? Why did we use Cordova um, for front-end applications? And I think the, the two biggest things that stood out for us was the write once aspect. I can write a good HTML application with CSS and use transforms and use some magic Angular or React or vanilla JS or whatever I want and be able to, with some good tooling, deploy to um, an iOS or a Android um, device. And, and so those, those are the sort of things that stood out. And then also, as I've mentioned, the freedom of choice. I, I can go HTML, um, CSS, pure JavaScript, Angular, React. The choice is mine. The choice is, as, as a developer is, is totally um, you open to, to do what you like there. So just a quick sort of overview of our architecture. I don't want to talk too much about Red Hat Mobile application as, as, as a technology. The thing that I really want, I don't know if you can see that's not so, so good, but at the bottom there is the cloud app. And what we have is an MBAS, is a, a mobile backend as a service. And just a, a quick um, sort of note here that everything we've done with Node.js um, and Cordova and the rest is all, all sort of based on, on microservices. So we have lots of services running. And then we have a core that helps us. We have a front end that helps us to do designs of forms, um, security, all that type of thing, to then deploy using the MBAS to deploy the Cloud App. And that's actually what I'm really interested in talking about, is the Cloud App, which is a, a Cordova plus Node.js backend on the Cloud. So the bulk of the talk, design considerations. I know this is quite a hectic looking thing. I had a pointer device and I left it at home. So I just wanted to touch basically on some of the aspects that we found when designing. It, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've designed web applications. I've designed simple mobile applications, nothing too heavy. Um, you put it out there and after you have a sort of a test of 10,000 concurrent users, everything falls over. You've got memory leaks all over the show. Things, things just don't work properly. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge that um, I think all of us will have when developing mobile applications. So at the top left, availability. Um, just roughly um, and quickly, um, say you're developing an application, a mobile application for a, a medical application that, that needs high availability, it can't go down 24-7, you need the thing up, so you've got aspects of replication, you, you're going to have some redundancy or form of redundancy with uh, many servers, um, so you start thinking about um, how, do, how do I then architect and have four or five back-end servers plus database, how do I load balance the whole thing? That's, that's just the sort of small aspect. And this list is in no, by no means exhaustive. It's just a couple of things that we found when developing applications. Things like scaling on the top right hand there, scaling. Um, what happens if I do the same app and it has 100 users and we test and everything's fine, but then the, the medical company wants us to go to 25,000 concurrent users. They just have this application just multiplying. It's a different monster then. We've got to start adding servers and we've got, again, looking at availability and um, being able to handle the throughput. Um, it becomes quite difficult to, to actually start thinking about engineering and, and developing and designing. And then logging on a, on a microservice level. And please, by no means do I say microservices are the be-all and end-all. Um, monoliths are just as good. We, have, we, as a company, have nothing against them. It's just that with a microservice, it just lends itself towards what we were doing on a mobile backend. But 
just with uh, quickly with a, with, a, with a monolith versus microservices, microservices, you're just moving all your problems to other other areas like centralized logging. So we've come up with massive problems with logging. So you've got 25, 30 microservices um, helping you realize your application. Um, and now you're trying to log everything. Um, you, you're looking at logs all over the show. You've got maybe 12 servers with 25 applications, um, serv services distributed over that. How do you get all the information? How do you log? And which, which service do you think is the problem? So it becomes a bit of a problem there as well. Monitoring. Things like um, if we have a high availability um, system and we need to scale and um, we need an early warnings sort of type of uh, system to tell us, listen, there's a, there's a server going down. The disk space is running out. CPU usage is a problem. Memory is a problem. And then we can quickly either take some form of action, change over to some other servers, or have some automated switching there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, request tracing is, is something that we found it very valuable. Is like adding a request ID through, through our system. We're using REST APIs basically throughout all our microservices. Um, and so we have a request ID that we can trace, and it helps us in, in finding a bottleneck in the system. So we, have, we want to measure the time that it takes through um, microservice A doing authentication, let's just say, and how much time is spent in the actual get or post of that actual request. Um, and that, that sort of helps when, when developing and you've got a massive big system and, and it's scaling and in production, it's really difficult. Things like metrics and analytics. Um, we've had requirements where people want to know, uh, um, I'm a user in EMEA in, in, in um, maybe the Asia Pacific region, region, and I want to know how many people in America are using this function, that function, this function, and how many times have they hit it at what time. So all that metadata stuff that we're able to track and log. And that also gets quite tricky when you've got many microservices and you're scaling 100,000 concurrent users. Then the big one, security. Um, we all know. I mean, how do you use HTT? Do you have SSL termination, edge termination? Do you um, uh, also include um, encryption, decryption? What type of encryption, decryption do you use? Um, are we going to... Um, are we going to have uh, separate microservices for authentication and other microservices for authorization? How the, will the two glue together? Um, does, it, does it fit inside a DMZ? Do we have the next part of it, um, which I'll talk about, is proxy? Do we work inside a, a, a proxy, uh, behind a proxy? And so these, these all add up. And, and then how, how do we then pass a token to each microservice? It becomes quite difficult. Another big one that we found was profiling. So we have everything in place. We, we've got everything working and running. And then we, we haven't actually looked at the tooling to create the 100,000 concurrent users. Um, so then you need some servers. You need some form of, of sort of hardware or uh, software and servers to, to stand up the simulation of 100,000 concurrent users doing gets and posts and all that type of thing. And then you need to gather that information and present it and see exactly what's happening to your system. Looking at memory usage, CPU, disk space, so on and so forth. Another thing that was quite hairy is versioning. And this really mainly applies to um, microservices. So if you are considering microservices, just be warned that versioning can be a nightmare, i.e. we have, like for example, the authentication module that needs a, a, um, a single sign-on patch or interface that is version 123 and it will not work with version 122. And so you need a way of then coordinating all the versions. If you've got 30, 40, 50 microservices, it just compounds. So, so there are advantages and disadvantages with microservices. Um, again, a, a big one, and we're actually working on that at the moment, is the, the use of proxy behind. Uh, we can't, you, you walk into a company and say, this is our offering, this is what, what we have, use it. 
And they say, no, we can't because we need a proxy. We have a proxy server. And that, then that changes the whole ballgame because you've got one point of entry now. A point, one point, and we've designed this thing to scale over hundreds of thousands of users, so you've got a, a, a point of entry, a point of exit, and if that server's not really robust, you have a problem. So it, it's a big thing to consider. And then quickly, testing, debugging. Um, we all know it's really difficult, especially uh, on, on a big enterprise application. Um, debugging. We have got some good tools, and thank goodness for um, the, the, the great stuff that, like with Node Inspector, and uh, most of you use Chrome or one of those type of browsers that have good debugging facilities. But it becomes tricky on a microservice architecture, and especially scaling. <coughs> Excuse me. Then two big things, building and deploying. Um, like I mentioned, we're using Cordova, so we are going to be deploying to iOS or to Android. Um, so you need, with, with iOS, you do need a Mac OS system to, able, to be able to actually take your, your um, application, build it, and deploy it to iOS devices. So that also becomes quite a big consideration on large-scale enterprise. And then, quickly, configuration and automation. Uh, configuration on microservices is also difficult because you've got... Thousands of microservices, each has a link to a database and maybe a cache and maybe some other uh, systems and logging and uh, sort of the, the sort of level of logging. And so you're reading in a JSON file or a YAML file, whatever it is. How do you actually know what is the configuration of each microservices? Do you have a general server that all the microservices look at and then pick up the configuration? All this type of thing. And then the big one is automation. If you could automate as much as possible, we all know that, um, especially with the testing, continuous integration and, and continuous deployment, the more that you can do that, the better it is for delivering a really sort of quality product. So a quick checklist that it's not exhaustive again. It's the, something that I've sort of found over the, over the years is don't over-engineer. If you are going, even with a monolith, even if you're looking at a monolith, do not over-engineer. Make your application do one thing and do it well. Um, I mean, there's a lot to say about that. It, and these two tie in with each other. Future optimization, like I'm, I'm trying to now make sure that my application will handle 100,000 concurrent users. You might have workers, you look up the CPU usage in Node and you say, okay, I've got four CPUs available. I'm going to set up four workers and then have them multi-threaded, uh, uh, then talk to a multi-threaded Java app at the back end, whatever it is. Um, and you start thinking about all these things. And then what happens is with over-engineering and, and actually trying to future optimize your, your application, you get analysis but, and actually you'd get nothing done. And, and it's happened. It's happened to us as a team, and we've decided, let's, because of, of, of the monolith background that we did have using microservices, we did learn that if we do the simple, concentrate on one function and do it well, you, you, get, you get results. So just for my, my advice for when designing, just do the simple and do it well. The other thing that we also found was interfaces. We had... If you define an interface, it's great because you can say, I've got a structured JSON input, and this is what it's going to look like. I've got a structured JSON output. This is what it's going to look like. Um, and then stick to it. If you stick to that interface, um, and maybe it has a structured config interface as well, what happens is when you design that, and I'll, you, you'll see later when I speak about the technologies that we use, you basically can pull that interface out and the implementation, um, the, I mean, the interface stays there, the implementation you can pull out and put anything else in there. Um, and it doesn't matter what technology you use, you can write the thing in C++ if you wanted to. But if you adhere to that interface, you, you're away. And it, it's really good, it's good design practice. I don't want to talk too much about test-driven development, we just found that it really, really is helpful, especially with large-scale um, enterprise applications. Logging is a big one. We found that in a microservice architecture, logging to a file, 
hides away the ability to go and search. So we've got to go into SSH, into the server, look for the file, open the file and read it. So we've, we've put everything using, using simple like Bunyan, a JSON output that we can filter and clean up and then, and then log to output. And it really works well. And, it, and especially with a re request ID in there, you can find your, your problem quite fast. Another thing that really works well is peer reviews. There are guys on our team that are really, really, um, really sort of, they have so much knowledge about enterprise applications. And by learning from them, you gain in, uh, sort of a great um, sort of understanding. And so it's a good thing. It's a good thing to do peer review. You're sharing knowledge and you're not forming silos. And this, this really helps. And then the big one, tooling. Um, again, that falls into the automation um, sort of if you can actually get some form of aut automated build and, and build some tools to help you automate all the processes, all the better. Right, so the big question, how do we do all this? And this is the thing that I really want to leave you with. And I know it, it, it would have been better with code snippets and a demo, but... This is what I have, so bear with me. The technologies. And, and this is what I want to leave you with. We use Docker, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. Now, I know you all know about Docker. Docker is small Linux containers, basically. And by developing your Cordova app, your Node.js app, all you need to do, and if you have done that simple and you've done it well, you build it into a Docker container. And so you might say then, okay, so I've got 30, 40 Docker containers. How do I get everything to talk to each other? And I'm using REST APIs, and over here I'm using some other form of um, inter-process communication or whatever. And that's where the likes of Kubernetes comes in. And please, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to push over um, Red Hat software. What I'm trying to get across, are there tools out there that can really help you scale the enterprise? And Kubernetes is that. It is developed by Google. It is really amazing, amazing technology. Um, if Google have done something, that they know about scaling. And um, what it is at the, at the sort of base of everything is that Kubernetes is a Docker orchestrator. So it takes all your Docker images and orchestrates it. And it has the concept of um, a master, you'll have a master node and slave nodes. And the great thing about it is that if I need another 10,000 concurrent users, I just add more slave nodes, what they call nodes. And now each node has the concept of a service and a pod. And the pod has, um, it has the ability to have several Docker containers in it. But usually what the, the sort of good best design practice is they have a pod with one container and it does one function and one function only. It's really easy to debug and to deploy. And then OpenShift. OpenShift is just a wrapper around Kubernetes developed by Red Hat. Um, it just adds extra security um, and this, it's, it's, it allows you to use YAML and JSON to actually take your Docker containers and, and deploy them on OpenShift. The great thing about this technology is that everything I've spoke about in the design considerations, these, these technologies help you. You're able to scale. You're able to, you're able to have high availability. Um, the, the way Kubernetes works is that if you say, I want a minimum of three pods for my um, authentication module and one pod goes down, it's self-healing. It recreates it for you automatically. So your high availability is, 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 is organized for you. you. You need more. You add more nodes. The scaling is, is, is handled for you. By simple configuration, you can add in metrics. So you can actually, it has a, a really nice interface. It has a graph and it shows you each pod, memory usage, CPU usage, and what's happening to that specific container. It, it handles the, the security for you. Yes, you have to also think about security, but the, the OpenShift 
stack has a, a thing called uh, service accounts and uh, uh, um, security context. And you can then add and run and allow Docker containers to run with root, without root, and restrict, really restrict usage on those things. And so um, things like um, logging, we have a, uh, a centralized logging system based on, it's the EFK. Um, it uses FluentD, Kibana, and Elasticsearch. It is, that is quite heavy, so what we do is we deploy that on a complete node on its own. So basically you'll have a server with um, something like 16 gig of RAM with four core processor handling that because it is written in Java and it is quite heavy. But the nice thing is you've got one interface to handle, <coughs> excuse me, to handle information coming from all of your, all of your pods. It actually injects, uh, injects um, with FluentD and it pulls out information. And then via Elasticsearch, you can go search for specific request ID or whatever. So it's really, really powerful. Um, the concept of, um, I just took a quick screenshot of what, what we have. And just, so the concept also of persistence and persistent volumes, we, you, you can actually create and you can use different kinds of um, persistence like uh, NFS or Gluster or, or the likes of AWS um, um, stores and, and, and so on. Um, so basically, just to explain the interface quickly, is that there you have, um, over here, you have a pod. The pod has one, one Docker image in it, um, which is a, a Node.js image handling um, the second one, there's Nagios, which is a C, um, a, a, a C application. But it just gives you the ability to, to, to be able to plug in different types of architecture that you have if you adhere to a specific interface. I can go up and scale that pod to 20 if I wanted to, just by clicking the up arrow. There's a top part there. I don't know if you can see. There's a bar at the top there that is a root. And the root really is a service, and the service then load balances on those pods. Um, and so all the, all the real heavy lifting for scaling the enterprise is taken care of by using um, OpenShift. Now, it is really, really easy to, to actually implement and use. You need Docker, install Docker, go to the OpenShift origin GitHub project. All of this is open source. And actually, we welcome you guys to do PRs against um, all our open, uh, open source um, uh, repos. Um, it, it's wonderful to have a community out there that can actually contribute to, to this stuff. And basically, so you have um, Docker installed. You use um, the origin, uh, origin client from OpenShift. And it installs. A, a, a single node container, a single node cluster for you on, on your machine. Um, just by one command, you do OC cluster up, boom, away you go. And then you can just with JSON and your Docker images deploy and scale the enterprise and know that you can do it. Because all you then need is to have a back end system with lots of nodes. We use Ansible to deploy. At the moment, we've, we've done a test on a, um, just as some information on a 12, 12 node cluster and we can scale up to 100,000 concurrent users, no problem. Um, and all our testing, all our integration, all our developments done on a one node cluster. So we know that this works. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, basically, that's basically me. Um, I will have the sl uh, slides up on, on, I actually do, I think I have it on GitHub. Um, these are the, the, the sort of repos that you can go and have a look at. The Feed Henry one is our MBAS. Um, and please, you don't need to use an MBAS. You can use whatever you like. But um, all of this is open source. Um, you're welcome to put PRs against them and see if you can um, upgrade and uh, make it better. Um, the Error Gear Digger Jenkins is a, is a really cool thing, it's something that I've also worked on. Um, we've actually implemented a, a Jenkins pipeline within OpenShift. So in your OpenShift dev node, you can include Jenkins and you can then, we've at the moment only got Android working. 
you all know that with iOS, the, the licensing and the certs and that type of thing is quite difficult. So you can go in, build with your Cordova app, use the Jenkins pipeline, build an Android app, and have the APK um, deployed to your phone or mobile device. Um, the other one is uh, OpenShift Origin. I put it in there so that you can actually go down the, download the client and start up OpenShift. OpenShift includes Kubernetes, by the way, and then it will then use your Docker registry to create. And then the last one, the Feed Henry Raincatcher, is a pure workflow management system that we've developed on top of OpenShift, built on Angular, completely um, with, with Angular, and um, it is a, a complete workflow manager that um, we want to make as generic as possible with uh, a form designer that, that could basically anyone could use to create different workflows. So please have a look at those and please contribute. We'd love it. Thank you. That's me. Yeah, we can for a couple of questions. Questions then? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned security, and uh, you said that you kept your uh, authorization and authentication of uh, services separate. Um, how do you handle that? Do you have a, a DMZ where the, the authorization service is checking everything that's going in, or is there a, each time it's open? Yeah, you, uh, it totally depends on, on, the, on the company that we work Like, if we, at the moment, there's, a, there's quite a large company that's actually, it's a bank that's looking at, at our offering. And they have a, a DMZ, so the whole of the whole OpenShift cluster will uh, operate in the DMZ. We have within the the, the node; it's a Node.js application. Um, the auth module just works on pure REST APIs with with HTTP, and H we can choose HTTPS as well. It's simple. Um, it does it does pure authorization, and then it hands off um, authentication to another module. Like we have. It's just because the way Red Hat is, the whole architecture works on, you have um, a customer reseller, the resellers and, and customer could have several projects, and some users can have access to several projects, and then within each project, you will know that you've got different modules, you can read, write, or update, and we've got to restrict some users to basically do that type of thing. So I hope that answers your question, it's, it's all within there, yeah. We just basically, it's, we have the spec to do something and then we, we just use Node. Uh, basic, simple patterns to, nothing, nothing, nothing spectacular. We have a test, it's, it's based on, we, everything will be REST API, so we say, okay, we need to then do a post. We know this is the JSON input and this is the JSON that I expect, so we will then, <coughs> We will then either mock that out, we use sign-on, or, or um, f if we, we actually have um, mock goose and, and that type of thing for Mongo and mongoose mocking. Um, but we try, we try everything though, it's not just unit testing. Um, a big part of microservices is also that we do a, f a sort of, it is difficult though, I must say. So we'll do unit testing and acceptance testing and then do a full end-to-end -end or integration test. Um, but that means that we have to have the full application running. Um, you could mock out different services, but then it, it just doesn't give you, you don't feel confident really. So we found that we'll have a, a, a complete test environment set up so that we can do a full end-to-end -end test of our system. But simple REST API for us, JSON in, JSON out. This is what we expect. Mock that out, yeah. Okay, thanks a million. Thank you.